Hello, this is Dr. Paul Cottrell, and I'm going to do another episode of the war with Israel and Hamas and the potentiality of the wider world, wider war in the region and in the world. Um, it's November 14th at just after nine o'clock. Markets haven't opened yet. Um, Future Dow futures are up quite a bit, 354, and S&P 500 is up 58. That's the futures market. New York opens up at 930, so we'll see what, what happens with that. Um, now, uh, there's going to be a pro rally for Israel in Washington, D.C., quite a few financial professionals in New York are going to it, all right? Um, we'll see, you know, what transpires. I, well, you know, most likely it will be peaceful, but there will probably be, be some conflicts between the pro-Israeli and the pro-Palestinian crowds. So we'll see what happens. Um There's going to be quite a bit of evidence in today's broadcast that shows how Hamas was embedding around the hospitals, inside the hospitals, or in the basement of the hospitals. Oh, and by the way, there's evidence that they actually had the hostages there, too. So we're going to really deep, do a deep dive on that. And if you're you know, a pro-Palestinian, pro-Hamas, go fuck yourself. All right, here we go. This is Fox News two hours ago. Uh, thousands expected to gather a national mall for pro-Israel rally. Pro-Israel demonstrators are expected to gather at the National Mall in Washington, D.C. for today's March for Israel. And also in D.C., college students will testify today to House lawmakers about how to confront anti-Semitism on college campuses after numerous reports of harassment and violence from pro-Palestinian supporters. Sahar Tartak is a student at Yale and will testify at that hearing. She's also gonna be attending the March for Israel that will take place on the National Mall later today. And she joins me now. Sahar, good morning to you. What a day, two very meaningful events that you are taking part in. So what is your message this morning ahead of your testimony on Capitol Hill later today? Sure, thank you so much for having me this morning. So what I'm going to tell our representatives is that for the past month and a week now, I and my peers have had no time or opportunity to mourn the loss of our 1,400 plus relatives across the sea because we have been too busy handling various anti-Jewish events of hatred and the universities have failed to protect us and that representatives have an opportunity to penalize them. Yeah, I understand that you wrote an article. Uh, the I don't think that the universities have a have an obligation, quote, to protect, all right? They have an obligation that if these protests get out of hand, that they could kick the students out. They can, you know, s sanction these you know, some of these student groups, some of them are on visas. They can revoke the student visa. But, you know, it, when you're talking about actual physical protection, you, you know, there's security of the university and there's, you know, the municipality police and all that. But I'm not, I'm not sure if protect is the correct word here. Now, that may be a nuance. That may be getting into, you know, the fine details. You know, she's on major news, so maybe she just picked the wrong word. But protect, I'm not sure is the right word. But there is a systemic issue in U.S. universities, especially high-end U.S. universities, like the top 20, that are extremely anti-Semitic, all right? Uh, you know... For me, you know, because I'm Jewish, I will never, ever, ever, ever donate to Harvard University again, ever. And then on top of it, um, there are 1,600 alumni 
that have that have stated that they're not going to donate to to Harvard. So, you know, the bottom line is this. These universities are going to get further pressure that they didn't do anything to shut down these out of control ultra liberals. Right. And there is a tendency within the professorship class at these universities, they're promoting this rhetoric. So it's not just the student body. See, the word to protect is the wrong word. They need to hold the student bodies accountable and they have to hold the university professors accountable. And you know what? There may need to be a clearing out of the ultra liberal out of the universities and have it more 50-50. You know, they pick, they, you know, they it, to become a professor is hard, a tenured professor. Pr professor. There's an awful lot, even at Harvard, there's an awful lot of, lot of adjuncts, right? Um, you know, but unfortunately, majority of these professors are ultra liberal. And so it promotes, especially in the colleges, and when they're when the, the students are impressionable, they end up absorbing this ultra liberal crap. So it's it hold the university accountable for promoting this ultra liberalism. And then you know you know with these higher universities you know, like Yale, Penn, um, uh, Cornell, Yale, Harvard, right? They all have these different uh, alumni and clubs, right? Well, within those clubs, you're going to have conservatives that are actually going to push, start pushing back. So when these presidents of these universities come and, you know, do their little circuit at the, at the different clubs for their school, especially in New York, you're going to have conservatives pushing back on the I'm the president of Harvard. And they're going to say, you know what? You know, you're failing the alumni because you're pushing an agenda. You're pushing this liberal fucking agenda. This is, this is, there's going to be lawsuits against the universities. Watch. There's going to be lawsuits against these universities. And there's going to be a major pushback on the conservative, the, the conservative crowd of the alumni of these universities pushing back on these ultra liberal boards that are running the, the universities. And it's gonna hurt them. And I guarantee you, they will pick money over quote their principle. And what's the phrase? Go, you know, go woke, go broke. Chances are the ones that really have the money are the ones that actually are conservative. You wrote an article. Uh, the article is titled, Is Yaley's for Palestine a Hate Group? And two weeks later, it received an editor's note that said, this column has been edited to remove unsubstantiated claims that Hamas raped women and beheaded men. They called those claims unsubstantiated, edited your column as a result of this decision. What went through your head when you saw that editor's note? To be honest, there's just no shock anymore. I mean, I get back to school and my peers are shouting, resist justified by the hundred and multiple anti-Israel, pro-Hamas student rallies. And so I see something like this and I say, okay, so they're no longer justifying Hamas's brutalities. They're just denying them outright. And how can I be surprised? University. And that's why I said that the ultra liberal is going to start eating its tail. They're coming after the Christians. Watch. Watch, it's not just the Jews. They're coming after the Christians in the Western society. Watch. And I'd be surprised. The university has done nothing to stop them. Yeah, and you know, these claims were substantiated by members of Hamas themselves when they recorded these heinous and barbaric actions. So there is horrific proof out there that shows that these things did take place. Uh, this mark for Israel today, it, it's expected to be quite an event. Organizers expect 100,000 people to attend all the National Mall. 
What do you hope is achieved by this? I really hope that our lawmakers are able to see that this issue is important to the Jewish community in a way unlike Israel issues have been in the past. This has become now so black and white. This has become such a question of life and death for Jewish people, both in America, in the United States, on our college campuses, and across the sea in Israel. But if they mess this up, the stakes are high. Yeah, and it's important also to really strengthen the president's resolve and show him that despite what some progressive Congress women might say, that a majority of the American people do stand with him through his support for Israel. So at the same time as that's happening, there have been many pro-Palestinian, at times pro-Hamas protests. Are you surprised at that level of people that, you know, the volume of people in this country that would outright support a designated hate group, terrorist organization? To be honest, unfortunately, I'm not surprised at all. Listen, in the 1930s, thousands of Americans showed up to pro-Nazi rallies, mm -hmm. and I view this as no different. And it's fascinating because these are often found in the pockets of really elite academia, right? Yale, Harvard, Cornell. And being an academic elite seems to not stop anybody from being supportive of a terrorist organization. It might even propel you to that opinion. Yeah, we will be speaking out later on Capitol Hill and then marching in this march for Israel that's taking place on the National Mall, 1 to 3 p.m. Eastern time. So if you're in the area or want to travel, I'm sure that everybody would welcome the support. So Hart Tartak, thank you so much for joining us on this busy day for you. We appreciate you. it. Mark my words, if Dr. Paul Cottrell isn't wrong, this is coming to the Christians. This is coming to Western society. All right, next. CNN reporter saw inside hospital basement in Gaza. All right, are you ready? Here we go. And any of you, you that are watching that are crazy liberals, sit down, right? Because your whole world is going to be proven wrong. of absolute destruction. The rare inside look at how the IDF is fighting comes at a consequential moment in this war, as the American president says that the Strip's main hospital must be protected. Now, Israel says the very same facility houses a Hamas command complex below it, and CNN reported the story that you're about to see under Israeli Defense Force escort at all times, but CNN did not submit its script or its footage to the IDF. And CNN retained editorial control over the final report that you'll see now. Driving into Gaza with the Israeli forces, it's a war zone. The conditions of our access only show officers, no faces of soldiers, and don't show sensitive equipment. We are passing mile after mile of destruction, buildings blown, collapsed, Nothing untouched by the fury of Israel's hunt for Hamas. Streets here crushed back to sand. Shops, everything that we see, no sign of any civilians here. And the soldiers have been telling us that even inside the stores, they've been finding things like rocket propelled grenades ready to use against them as they were advancing through this area. That's Paying your bills on time raises your credit score, right? Wrong. In fact, this is the first of three major credit score lies you're being told. A few miles in, we pull up at a command post. Soldiers living in blown apartment buildings. Every building I'm looking at here, wherever you turn, is destroyed and shot up. Hard to imagine how civilians endured the bombardment here. Our next journey much deeper into Gaza. We arrive a hundred meters from a battle with the mass. Tanks blasting targets in nearby buildings. The IDF's top spokesperson waiting for us. Now we're now conducting an operation. 
Israel is facing massive international pressure over the destruction of homes, the shockingly high civilian death toll. And in the last few days, over its apparently heavy-handed tactics at hospitals. Dari has brought us here to show the connection he says exists between Hamas and the Rentisi Children's Hospital. We are now here in an area between a hospital, a school, and a terrorist house. A Hamas commander, he says, lived there. He points out the solar panels on the roof. This is a tunnel that was lighted. Like this the floor. You can see here. This is the ladder going down. The ladder going down. This is the ladder going down. Okay, yeah. This is a 20 meter tunnel. Look at here. Look at the look at the look at the panel. Look at here. Look here. But look down here. You see, they both are going down to the tunnel. Okay. So they're hardwired so, into so the tunnel. I wanted to show you the solar panels on the terrace house. Provide electricity directly to the tunnel. We've entered, we've entered the robot inside the tunnel, and the robot saw a massive door, a door that is on the direction of the hospital. We're in what is an active fire zone here. You can hear the small arms fire. The IDF say they're still clearing the terrier out. They're getting down here. Yeah. The other side did a bit of cover, but they say we're still taking fire. But over here, we were able to smell what smelled like rotting flesh, bodies perhaps going underneath the rubble. Oh, no, don't go up high. Don't expose yourself. As we move off to the hospital, a hundred meters away, we're still taking fire. We're still conducting an operation. Operation conducted by a special unit, the Israeli Navy SEALs. Why doesn't Al Jazeera have one of their Doha? journalists embed themselves on the Palestinian side and get an idea of their, their perspective. No, they wouldn't do that. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, these individuals from Hamas are so evil that they, they embed themselves in the schools and in the hospital systems and how the mainstream media has tried to demonize the Israelis and demonize the IDF. And I'll tell you, the way things work on a metaphysical level is with enough time, there's enough rope to hang all the ultra liberals with their, their stupid logic and their, their lies. It's amazing, it's absolutely amazing. The Israeli Navy SEALs are researching the hospital. Shadari later tells us he took a big risk bringing us into such a combat zone. It is clear he wants this story told. We're searching here to see the connection of the tunnel to the hospital, okay? We are looking for the connection. As we finally reach the hospital, it is already getting dark. A huge hole has been blasted through the walls into the basement. Why is the hospital so damaged? We're talking, why is the hospital so, so damaged? I'll, I'll yeah. explain. So we have to call yeah. 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 We came to this hospital five days ago. There were still patients inside the hospital. We did not enter into the hospital. He claims since then, all patients were evacuated by hospital staff. We assist this evacuation, of course, to make it a safe pass for all the patients in the hospital. We do not know that the hospital is entirely clear. We do not know. We only entered to this area was what, which was suspected because we're being fired. Gari leads us through a warren, a basement. Corridor. They didn't say that on Al Jazeera. They didn't say that on MSNBC. They didn't say that on, you know, some of these other ultra, ultra wing networks that are trying to demonize the Israelis. And a lot of times it's on CNN. In this case, they're not doing it on CNN. They evacuated the hospital before they went in to try to do seek and destroy. They 
hit the regions around the hospital, taking fire from, you know, areas, you know, by the hospital, evacuate, and then go in harder. <laughs> no, but on Al Jazeera, there's going to be demonization of the Israelis. I'll tell you, do not trust Ishmael and Esau. Do not trust them. Do not trust them. They're a bunch of wild fucking animals. A basement corridors to this room. This was the armory. Okay? This was the Hamas armory. Yeah. He shows us a few rusting guns and some explosives. These guns alone have potentially huge implications for Gaza's hospitals and Israel's apparent push to take control of them. The International Committee for the Red Cross say that hospitals are given special protection under international humanitarian law in a time of war. But if militants store weapons there or use them as a base of fire, then that protection falls away in other rooms. So international this. amnesty doesn't tell you that on Al Jazeera. International amnesty tells you how the Israelis are so such criminals in, in war. That's war crimes, and the IDF needs to be held accountable for all these war crimes on the hospitals. But this is proof that they've been using the hospital, not just as storage, but to hold the fucking hostages. That well, proof will be coming. He shows us a motorbike with a bullet hole in it that he suspects was used by Hamas attackers October 7th. And nearby, possible evidence, hostages could have been held here. We are now in the basement in the same area, yard from the motorcycle. We see her a chair, we see her a rope. We see her a woman's clothes or a woman's something covering woman. She thinks a woman was tied up in this chair. This is an assumption going to be checked by DNA. For evidence, Hagari says, points towards Hamas and possible hostage presence below the hospital. And by bringing us here to this hospital and showing us the connection that you believe exists between the terrorists and the possibly hostages, what does this say about the other hospitals here in Gaza? Cynically, Shifa Hospital is known by facts, by intelligence, to be a terrorist hub. And also, it's suspicious also in holding hostages. This is the best shelter for the terror war machine of Hamas. But the hospital authorities said they have no knowledge of Hamas or other groups inside the hospitals. Is that possible? I think it's not possible for an hospital to have this kind of an infrastructure. We knew the terrorists were here. We How knew. You know? We knew. By intelligence, and also we got some fire from this area. From this area? This from this area, and, and we were right to fire because what we found in armory. There's so much damage all around here. So yeah, what? There is damage all around here because Hamas made it impossible for us to fight him. He built all this infrastructure in tunnels and in hospitals around areas populated. As we exit the hospital, it is the Israelis are doing the right thing. We're just getting ready to leave right now. The firefight still going on, still intense, bullets fired, explosions going on up the street there. This war and the controversies surrounding it far from resolved. Nick Robertson, CNN, Gaza. I think that was an excellent report from, from Nick and CNN. A lot of times CNN has been very biased. <coughs> but this is proof positive what I've been saying since I started covering this crisis. All right. And that is the only way to solve this problem is to destroy Hamas, Hezbollah, and Iran. Oh, by the way, the 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 northern front starting to starting to get a little bit hot and heavy. Next, Iran does not want a war with the U.S. directly because they're doing pro proxy wars with Hezbollah. Oh. Adam, why not? I took out some Iranian. All right, so U.S. warplanes finally took out some Iranian terrorists. Good. But is it going to really matter? Why not stop a ship? Why not sink a ship? What about bombing an oil field? Yeah. Grand? That might get their attention during this day. Oh, yeah. Star Force Star General. Chairman. Signing fucking kick ass. 
Fox News strategic, uh, senior strategic analyst and a Presidential Medal of Freedom recipient. All right, General Key, this is kind of an update. They look maybe a half a grade point bolder, but I don't, I don't know. We're not hurting Iran. These things are still kind of pinpricks. Yes, we killed some terrorists. We don't know who they are. I, I mean, it's, it's up to you, Joe, but I think you need to do a little more. <laughs> Well, I suspect so, too. I mean, this, this t attack by the United States is different. It's focused on people, you know, versus the weapons and the ammunition and the storage sites. But I think when the Iranians look at this, look, if they're willing to trade a significant number of their proxies uh, in terms of the objective they're attempting to achieve here. And, you know, for Iranians' benefit, benefit, their strategic objective for 43 years has been to dominate, control the Middle East, and also control the uh, Persian Gulf flow of oil, and to do that, they need to push the United States military out of the Middle East, and that is what the pressure on our 13 bases is all about here, and they also need to destroy the state of Israel. This is something they talk about every single year. So the trade-off here, Larry, is look at this people in the United States questioning why we still have troops in Iraq and Syria that seem to be vulnerable to being killed on these bases by the Iranians. That's exactly what Iran wants to hear. The second thing is, we're sending a message, I think, by not stepping up here and, and stopping these attacks to our Arab partners and other allies in the region. The Iranians are certainly communicating this. Look, the United States can't, prevent it, can't protect its own troops. What makes you think they're gonna be able to protect yours? So yes, I mean, I, what I think, you, we should do a comprehensive attack against the proxies, leaders, fighting and Iran, storage, general structure, etc. Oh, even after Larry, even even after that, oh, yeah. look, after general, that, putting, that I'm, putting in my bid, I'm putting in my bid for oil fields. I mean it. I don't mean to interrupt you. I don't mean to interrupt. You know, I love your spectrum. You're my well, you doing a pretty good job of it. I know. Uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> but I want to get so, in. You Destroy money. Iran. Decapitate the Ayatollah. Money for financing all these terrorists is oil. They are selling oil to China. We're going to talk about it in the next segment. Why not hit oil fields? Well, I, I think if we go, we the point I'm trying to make is we have to go after the Iranians. We've had two American presidents who figured this out. Reagan, who suffered through the Marine barracks bombing, two embassies destroyed all in the same year. And he figured out a few years later, as the Iranians were shooting at our ships, interfering with the, Persian, the flow of Persian Gulf oil, obviously we were trying to escort that oil out of there. He attacked the IRGC bases and also oil and oil platforms. The only way this is going to be solved is killing the Ayatollah. The second thing is President Trump. After they were attacking, again, U.S. presence in the region, President Trump decided to go after the person that was ordering those attacks, and that is Qasem Soleimani, the head of the IRG, which was, I think the United States is capable of, of selecting the targets once they make up their mind that they got to move towards Iran. If I was recommending it, I would stay in the chain of command of the IRGC that is supporting these proxies, and that is their training center in Iran, also their bases, uh, as Reagan took on, and also their headquarters. But there are plenty of targets that are available to the United States. You have suggested a couple of them as well. The real decision and the issue is the unwillingness to deal with Iran because of fear that that would provoke right. a direct conflict and a war with the Iranians. 43 years of history with the Iranians tells you that is not the case. The whole issue of having proxies is to avoid that. Iran does not want a war with the United States directly. Would they respond if we attacked them significantly, like President Trump did or like Reagan did? Likely. But it also stopped the escalation after that. Right. And that's exactly what is needed here. I was in both of those administrations. I will never interrupt you again, General King. Never, ever. I apologize. I will not interrupt you. No more. <laughs> Please forgive me. <laughs> Please forgive me. <laughs> I'm not going to hold you to that. <laughs> yes.
Iran. All right. Hamas is losing control of the northern part of Gaza Strip. Netanyahu spokesman. A spokeswoman. Pardon me. And an Israeli journal, journalist, uh, welcome back. Thank you very much for being here today. But one of the headlines that came today is that Gaza is, that Hamas is losing control of Gaza. What does that mean? They're losing control of the northern part of the Gaza Strip. It doesn't, it doesn't mean, mean that, that there are no Hamas terrorists over there whatsoever that we discovered every tunnel shaft and so on. But they are losing control. Let's try this again. Yeah, let's reset on this. All right, let's try this. Okay, let's try it again. Alex, thank you very much. Joining me now, Tal Heinrich, spokesperson for Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu and an Israeli journal, journalist, Tal. Welcome back. Thank you very much for being here today. But one of the headlines that came today is that Gaza is, that Hamas is losing control of Gaza. What does that mean exactly? They're losing control of the northern part of the Gaza Strip. It doesn't mean that there are no Hamas terrorists over there whatsoever, that we discovered every tunnel shaft and so on. But they are losing control. Some of them are already withdrawing southwards. Um, and uh, we will get to each and every one of them. The IDF first encircled Gaza City. Then we started conducting more deepening our raids inside and we're acting in a very surgical and, and tactical way very judiciously because we want to reach each and every one of these terrorists behind the October 7th massacre and um, their infrastructure. And I want to play for you actually before I do that there, there's you know Hamas leaders are saying that one of the reasons that they attacked on October 7th was so brutal and so barbaric was to incite the kind of response that they're seeing they want permanent war they say we're not here for you know, water and electricity in Gaza. We want to change the entire dynamic in the Middle East. So when you see what's happening in the northern part of Israel, how much of a concern is that for the prime minister that you're gonna get? But, well, Israel has fought wars on combined fronts in the past, and we won these wars, but we definitely hope that the situation on the northern border with Hezbollah will not escalate further into a full-fledged war. We have warned Hezbollah, uh, President Biden warned Hezbollah and said, just don't, don't test us, don't test Israel. And um, you know who will suffer the most if Hezbollah tries, uh, you know, to provide us with a cases belly scale attack? That will be the people of Lebanon, because just like Hamas, Hezbollah doesn't care much about the population over there in Lebanon. And you know how much the Lebanese people have suffered in recent years. We don't want another war on another front. So we're telling them, uh, you know, stop this. We are deterring. We are acting very judiciously over there as well. And we see that. Hezbollah, we know already that they have embedded themselves just like Hamas in civilian structures, civilian population. Well, we've spoken to a number of uh, IDF officials and they all say that they are trying hard to prevent civilian casualties. We see the numbers though that are obviously uh, very difficult to think about. We see what's going on in the hospital in terms of how hard it is for these doctors that are on the ground. Uh, Trey Yates went into a Gaza hospital. He also went to a, into an Israeli hospital. Uh, to show both sides of this story. And then he spoke to an IDF spokesperson. He, here's a bit of their exchange. I can say for sure, there is no humanitarian crisis in Gaza. Of course, the, situ the situation is not I, easy. I, I would push back on that, sir. You would say there's no humanitarian crisis in Gaza? I am saying once again, there is no humanitarian crisis in Gaza. I know the situation is not easy. And we saw the video uh, that was shot in there in the hospital it certainly looks like a humanitarian crisis there are challenges nobody wanted this war war is a tragedy every loss of life is a tragedy every civilian suffering in gaza is a tragedy tragedy of a war that we didn't want we didn't start and we didn't even expect martha we are doing everything possible to ease the civilian suffering and civilian casualties, to minimize them. Hamas is doing everything possible to maximize them. They say in interviews that they want to sacrifice the Palestinian population of Gaza to uh, reach their goal of obliterating the Jewish state. They say it. 
Um, can you get a hospital ship in there? The prime minister said that they're going to have a hospital ship coming in from France to move these people from the hospital. Is that going to happen? And when? We don't have, uh, I can't pinpoint a date and time, but this is going to happen. And also the UAE and other uh, international partners will erect ho field hospitals and there's a floating hospitals. Uh, there are many initiatives that play. Okay, Tal Heinrich, always good to have you with us. Thank you very much, spokesman, spokesperson for uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. Good to have you. So, I want to Brian kill me. Uh, I can't see the end of his words. All right. Um, next one. Completely, completely outed, completely. It's not even written, written right. Completely outages. Complete outages, I guess. Sky News host blasts disgraceful student protests for Palestine. All right, let's see this. All right, this is seven minutes long. And Melbourne. Join me as Rowan Dean and through the spectator screen, host of Outsiders and Sky News every Sunday at 9 a.m. I never miss it. Uh, Rowan, the pro Palestine lobby recruiting school children to go and march for Palestine sounds really sus to me, very inflammatory. Well, it was completely outrageous, Andrew. And uh, certainly, if I had a child at school uh, who was uh, likely to be going on this. Uh, I can't speak for other parents, but I would certainly be making sure my child did not attend school on that particular day, because I think this is just disgraceful. Um, there's an argument for kids being exposed to, you know, political, uh, uh, the ins and outs of politics and the big issues of the day and so on and so forth. But uh, in this instance, uh, we are seeing, uh, we have, 1,500 horrific murders, abductions, rapes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I won't go through all the gory details, uh, and that should be the focus. Now, if these children are being taken by the teachers and demanding a ceasefire, as Penny Wong apparently did request and then didn't request, or whatever the latest nonsense going on in the Albanese government is, as they tear themselves apart trying to figure out how to uh, uh, not look like the craven cowards that they obviously are, um, what? Uh, what you would say, Andrew, is you would tell the kids, listen, we think, uh, you know, all wars are bad. And in order to uh, make sure there's no further suffering, uh, it would be good to have a ceasefire. And the conditions for a ceasefire are that, uh, which can be organized tomorrow, is that uh, the murderers, the murdering bastards who um, uh, ruin so many lives, uh, uh, give themselves up and hand back every single hostage. That's the moral thing that we should be teaching our children that if someone does something really bad they must be punished and they must make amends so until hamas surrenders uh, all it's all the everybody involved in that murderous rampage until it gives back every single yeah. hostage is accounted for yeah, and until yeah, hamas makes it clear how it will pay reparations to every murdered family then that's the preconditions for a ceasefire sorry andrew they don't even need to do that. They just need to surrender and then so to the work activity. And Israel will accept that. I mean, the idea, the ceasefire now is so dishonest, though, Rowan, because what, what are they saying? That after two or three days, okay, the war can continue. Now, the, what they'll be marching in the streets then for, another ceasefire, another ceasefire. It is a bull, I was going to say a bad word, it's a, it's, a, it's a dishonest catch cry. I think he was looking for the word bullshit. Honest catch cry. Surrender to Hamas should be the uh, cry. But here's the thing: the yeah, exactly. Palestinian supporters ask themselves why so many of their protests are aggressive and even violent. Why like Victorian police have had to rush 60 more officers to patrol Melbourne's Jewish Jewish areas, for instance. Why the office of Victorian Labor MP Kat Diopinas was defaced by pro-Palestinian activists because she supports Israel. You don't hear this level of harassment from pro-Israel supporters. No, of course not. And uh, the, this is where moral equivalency is so dangerous. And this is where teaching our children moral equivalency, we can see how it's polluted the minds of the left, of the trade unions, clearly of many teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, this sort of moral equivalency is poisonous. Uh, we must teach our children. It, it, for the West, it's important that we teach our children the lessons of two world wars. We never want to see that sort of carnage again. And we learned that the only way to end that sort of carnage is a decisive surrender of those who, who, who uh, wish you harm. 
must say, I've just come across the most pathetic example of anti-Semitism, in my opinion, uh, from a, a Sydney company that provides jumping castles for parties. They refuse the booking from Jewish uh, parents and said they don't want their blood money. I mean, if that's not anti-Semitic, I don't know what is. Um, but let's switch. Uh, Dan Andrews, Victorian Premier. You know, uh, no friend of uh, our show. <laughs> We're no friend of his. So, uh, the most uh, savagely repressive Premier uh, during the pandemic and an authoritarian to boot, is reportedly facing a ban from joining the Portsea Golf Club. It's switched there. One supposed reason that I was reading the media is that he locked down the morning to Peninsula, where the course is during the pandemic. Rowan, a ban on a Premier, is it fair enough or petty? <laughs> well, well, Andrew, I would have gone the other way. I would have um, allowed Dan Andrews to join my golf club. And then the moment he was out on the tee by himself or with his friends about to tee off, a group of police officers would have rushed on, tackled him to the ground, forced him to wear a mask, dragged him off, tasered him, shot rubber bullets at him, uh, you know, and given him the treatment that he gave so many people during COVID. Uh, I would have gone that way myself personally. but uh, And then I would have had a flight of stairs down from a beach cottage down to the lawn and seeing whether he could walk in a straight line without falling off it uh, before I gave him his membership dues to the club. Sorry, I'm just being sarcastic, obviously. <laughs> well, I think, in a sense, you can understand it because you remember during the pandemic, I, mean, I hate petty revenge policy. We've got to look at this. Right, stop this. But I, I will say this. Right. During the pandemic. All right, so now we're going to go to another CNN broadcast. I think his name's Mark Regev. CNN got an inside look at a children's hospital inside Gaza City where the IDF found tunnels that it says Hamas has been using. The IDF is also accusing Hamas of having a command complex beneath the Al Shifa hospital, the largest one inside of Gaza. The medical director there is describing catastrophic conditions that are happening. Premature babies being wrapped in foil, placed next to hot water just so they can stay warm. As the fighting outside the hospital is intensifying, President Biden issued this message today. And it's my open expectation that uh, there will be uh, less intrusive action relative to the hospital. The hospital must be joining me now is Mark Regev, senior advisor to Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu and the former Israeli ambassador to the United Kingdom. Now, Dr. Paul Cottrell is going to dissect that phrase. Biden says, right, Biden says, Gaza hospitals must be protected. All right. Protected from who? The Israelis or from Hamas? Because... Hamas is causing more destruction at the hospitals with the war tactics that they have than anything that the Israelis are doing. The Israelis are, are in the right on this, but the mainstream media will spin it that the Israelis are a bunch of baby killers. No, Hamas doesn't kill babies. No, 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 no. They're not responsible for digging in to hospitals using them as armories, potentially even, even uh, <laughs> holding hostages there in the basement. Unbelievable, I'll tell you. Time to kick ass. Our Israeli ambassador to the United Kingdom. Mr. Reagan, thank you for being here. President Biden just told reporters that he believes hospitals in Gaza must be protected. Is Israel preparing to strike the Al Shifa hospital or, or to go inside of it? No, hospitals are protected sites. We don't target hospitals and we don't target patients and doctors. That's obvious. That's part of our creed. What is a situation and what is a legitimate target is the Hamas military infrastructure around and under the hospital. And we have to take them out as surgically as we can without causing damage to the hospital, if at all possible, and to avoid harming the people inside. 
Okay, so Israel will not strike the Al Shifa Hospital. Is that correct? We won't target hospitals. We target Hamas. What about the thousands of people that are sheltering around that hospital complex? I mean, you can see from the imagery. That the answer is, civilians. if the terrorists are there and the civilians aren't getting the fuck out of the way, we're going to hit Hamas. See from the imagery that there are still civilians that are sheltering outside that hospital. Well, the, the good thing is the overwhelming majority of civilians have heeded our advice and have uh, fled the area. We, we asked people about a month ago already to start relocating to the south, and they have done so in their hundreds of thousands. The number of people left there is, is a very small group. And we will still, of course, distinguish between combatants, Hamas, who are our enemy, and we will target them between the innocent civilians and make a maximum effort. As I said a moment ago, to be as surgical as is possible in a very complex uh, combat situation. The Prime Minister said that Israel offered this hospital fuel, but what we are hearing from, from medical staff is that they're too scared to basically go outside to get it because they're they're fearful that Israel will fire on That's them. Are you shit. guaranteeing That's that so people bullshit. go outside to get the fuel, that they will be safe? 100%. We can guarantee that. I can't guarantee that Hamas won't uh, fire upon them, but they, from our point of view, we bought the fuel to about uh, 200, 250 yards from the hospital, and we said, come and pick it up, uh, because this was enough fuel for generators specifically uh, for the uh, for the babies uh, and needed the incubators. And, and we were trying to say, let's avoid a crisis inside the hospital. We bought the fuel. But as far as we understand, the fuel is still sitting outside the hospital. Hamas has forbidden hospital staff from going and picking it up. Well, some hospital staff had said it, it wasn't enough fuel, that it would have only provided about half an hour's worth of, of power and electricity. Caitlin, okay, that's the, 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 the fuel was for the incubators, uh, for, the, uh, for the babies, and there's more than enough there. If they run out, we'll supply more. You mentioned those babies. There are premature babies, uh, among See other See what I said about how, how the Palestinians will spin it, where they'll say, okay, so Israel's giving fuel. They said this fuel's for the incubators. This, this fuel's for you know, the pediatrics, all right? And then the Palestinians will say, well, it's not enough for the whole hospital. Well, Israel said this is only for the babies. Now, because every, all the crazy liberals are crazy, are, are worried about the baby count. I'll tell you, I'll tell you. Kill Ishmael and kill Esau. Among other patients that are still at this <laughs> hospital, you talked about these surgical operations that Israel is going to be doing around that hospital, given you believe Hamas is operating from underneath it. But before Israel does whatever it is going to do around Al Shifa Hospital, will it help facilitate the transfer of those those children, those preemie babies, and the other patients first? We've already said that we're willing to do so. We've said that we will facilitate the transfer of people. Uh, uh, patients, and if they need to be in ambulances, they can be in ambulance. But we have to understand what's going on here. This is a Hamas-made humanitarian crisis. Damn right. Because we provided fuel for the incubators for the babies, and we've suggested ambulances and a way out to, to move people out, and then Hamas has said no to any humanitarian solution. Right. They closed it off. They want pictures that will put international pressure on Israel to cease our military operation against them. And from their point of view, they're trying to be smart because they're waiting them hard. We're destroying their military machine. And they want us to stop. And so they're holding hostage. Everyone in that hospital Tell them preventing all. humanitarian uh, assistance, preventing the fuel, preventing the relocation of people in ambulances, just so they can try to galvanize international pressure on Israel to stop striking against their military machine. And what is, they're doing, of course, is, is a war Israel, crime paper. Is Israel willing... How do you conduct your operation if there are still children inside that hospital, premature children who right now are, are struggling to, to stay alive based on the accounts that we've heard? So I'm not sure, you know, what else we can do. We've provided fuel for the incubators so they could be safely inside the hospital for the time being. And we've provided, we're willing to facilitate ambulances to transfer them out of the hospital if they choose to leave, which is obviously the best solution. And both of those uh, uh, ideas, Hamas has vetoed. 
what are their two symptoms? The there are solutions, but Hamas is deliberately putting babies in danger for their own propaganda purposes. But Peyton, you shouldn't be surprised. How did they butcher Israeli babies when they crossed the, bo uh, the border on October 7th? I saw pictures of Israeli babies burnt to a cinder. I saw pictures of Israeli babies that were shot in their cots with multiple bullet wounds uh, uh, from machine gun fire in their cots. And of course, you know that our babies were also kidnapped by Hamas. Who kidnaps babies? Who shoots babies? So we should have no uh, qualms whatsoever, no, no problem in understanding that Hamas is willing also to sacrifice Palestinian babies for its crazy, radical, extremist agenda. I've seen that footage as well, and no one is defending Hamas here. But my question is, what about the children who are inside the Al Shifa hospital right now? And will you guarantee their safety first before Israel does whatever it is going to do, whatever operation you do have planned? No, 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 no. Hostages, babies, civilians, you try to, you know, you try to help. But if they don't get out of the way, if you've extended a peaceful hand, to try to evacuate them within a, a, a reasonable time frame that does not affect operations, then you do it. But if it's going to affect your operations to kill your enemy, you kill the enemy. This is why I take the stance. The hostages should have no bearing on the actual conducting of the war. Same thing. The babies in the, in the hospital should not be a determining factor, a major determining factor on how you can conduct a war to kill Hamas. The Palestinians, this is where the, the this is where this brunette broad, you know, with the you know the overdone eyebrows. They need to understand that the Palestinians are complicit because they allowed Hamas to dig in. And this is what happens when you're complicit. They're being punished. The Palestinians are being punished. And it's not because they're being punished by Israel. They're being punished by God. They made a decision not to fight Hamas for 15 freaking years, they made a decision to allow this to happen. They made a decision to lie on Al Jazeera or to misrepresent on Al Jazeera. And now they're getting punished. Don't be surprised that the babies get killed. Don't be surprised that the civilians get killed. Don't be surprised that all these things happen that are negative to the Palestinians. They did it to themselves. Now it's time to kick ass. Time to kick ass. <laughs> around the Al Shifa hospital. We will make every effort, and in accordance to international law, we distinguish between combatants, that's the Hamas terrorists who are our target, and non combatants who are civilians. And we, we will be as surgical as it's humanly possible. It's very difficult. She's I got that, that, she's got that, that little smirk in her face. <clears throat> Emotional fallacy. Emotional fallacy. She was also the one, if I'm not mistaken, was trying to railroad Trump when she was doing that town hall meeting. I'm pretty sure it's her that did it. <clears throat> the bottom line is this. Emotional fallacy is not going to play well for the ultra-liberal. Where was her concern with all this, the, the 60 million babies that were aborted? Hell, I don't even know if she had an abortion or not. I mean, with those eyebrows that she she has, I don't know. I can't tell. I mean, you know, you a baby killer? I'm not sure. Well, I admit that, Peyton, because you've got a situation where Hamas is deliberately abusing a humanitarian site, a, a site that is, uh, according to all the wars of, of armed conflict, you're not supposed to put your arms in a hospital. They're deliberately holding the, the patients there, the baby to protect their military machine, which is right under the hospital. It's complex. It's difficult. But if any finger of blame should be pointed, it must be at Hamas that has deliberately abused the hospital 
putting its military machine deliberately. It's premeditated crime. They've deliberately built their military machine, their command and control, their network of tunnels that lead to rocket launching sites and arms depots and other underground uh, uh, fortresses. They've deliberately built all that under a hospital. Ambassador Mark Reagan, thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you for having me. All right, now we're going to go to Benjamin Netanyahu. With Hannity. The Prime Minister just well, hours ago with Benjamin Netanyahu. And joining us now is Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Mr. Prime Minister, great to have you back. Um, we've, I've known you, we've been friends for decades, and I just want to express at the top of this interview uh, my deepest sympathy uh, for all that you and your fellow countrymen are going through. Um, I remember you stood strong and steadfast with America after 9-11 and how us did not, and I'm grateful for that. And I think it's now time for America to do the same for you. Uh, but I am my deepest sympathies for what you're dealing with. Well, thank you, Sean. And, uh, and thank the American people across the board, the American government, the uh, Congress, the Senate, uh, the president, everybody uh, has been very, very strong for Israel because they understand that our fight is your fight and our victory is your victory. And there is no substitute for victory. We have to have the forces of civilization beat these barbarians because otherwise this barbarism will spread and will endanger the entire world. Every American, uh, every civilized this is PNN, and we have to go to commercial. Go to my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com, and get your HealthMax 35. This is a structural nano silver liquid. You take a teaspoon of it a day. If you're not feeling well, take a tablespoon or two a day, and this will neutralize pathogens. You swish it in your mouth, you gargle it, you swallow it. All right? Take this daily and improve your health. Ashwagandha. This brings down the blood glucose levels and high blood glucose levels increases your inflammation. So you want to reduce that inflammation. It's part of the anti-aging protocol. Take ashwagandha daily. D3. You need D3 for many different reasons. One, to absorb calcium. But it also is really important for gene expression. You need proper gene expression to be able to have proper cellular processes. In addition, if a cell is infected, it needs D3 to help go through the apoptosis. I wonder why it was so important during the last crisis. Vitamin C. This is very important on a daily basis for skin health, for you know gum and mucosal lining. But in addition, it's, a, it's an antioxidant. It's not as strong as C60, but this is something that you should be taking daily. If you're not feeling well, increase your dosage. And drink water with it, filtered water. Turmeric. This, is a, this will bring down inflammation. And by bringing down inflammation, it's also an antioxidant. But by bringing down inflammation, you're going to reduce that, that stress on the body and it's part of the anti-aging protocol. Probiotic, I have it in a capsule form and I also have it in a powder form. You need a good gut biome to be able to, in, to absorb energy, to improve your metabolism, to actually improve your mental health, right? And your, your mental cognition. So in, it, it, take this daily, I mix it with hummus, but you can mix it with water or you can mix it in a smoothie. It's a, it's a powder. It has a little cup, has a little, has a little um, scooper. So it's just, you know, you just take a little scooper, right? In, the, in this and just use the scooper and take it once a day. Clarity factor. This will reduce the brain fog and it'll also help get those dendrites connected, right? Get those neurons firing. Your cognition will improve. Your memory will improve. You'll be able to focus at work and at school with a higher concentration. Take Clarity Factor every day. This is part of the anti-aging protocol to be able to improve your mental cognition. 
there are a lot of crazy liberals out there and you don't want to smell like a crazy liberal. Get my structural nano silver soap. I have many different varieties on my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com. Go get your structural nano silver soap. This one happens to be oatmeal spice, but I have lavender and, and um, lemongrass and peppermint and some others. And get the soap so you don't smell like a crazy liberal. Silver gel. This is really important because it'll neutralize pathogens. We're in the middle of cold season, all right? And you want to neutralize pathogens. Put it on your hands. It'll stay active for five hours. Put it around your mouth, around your nose, lightly coat your nostrils, around your eyes, around your ears, and inside your ear canal, lightly coated. It'll stay active for five hours. It'll help to neutralize pathogens. In addition, it helps as a skincare product, either because of a cut or an abrasion or um, acne or, or a, a minor burn. This will help to heal it. So you can use this as a skincare product. If you put it on your body at night, even your face, and you exfoliate it at, you know, when you wake up in the morning, you'll start noticing if you do this on a regular basis that your skin is, is improving. Go to my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com and get the products that I, I offer. It, is, it would be a great way as a gift during the holidays to you know, help someone move in the right direction to improve their health. Follow my protocol and you'll slow down aging. You'll improve your immune system and you're going to get healthier. Back to the moose. Happen, uh, every civilized country would be under peril. We have to win. There is no substitute for victory. Total victory. Uh, I, I, I hear you say that. It reminds me of Winston Churchill in World War II. What, what, what is our aim? Our aim, I could say in one word, victory. Then he spoke at length, victory against a monstrous tyranny. And this group, Hamas, is only one of your enemies, and they have in their very chart of the Hamas, Hezbollah, Iran, destroy. Uh, you actually use the phrase, if I could read it to you, if you want peace, you have to destroy Hamas. Um, I agree with you, but that's Hamas in the south. Rockets are being fired into your country from the north out of Lebanon. Uh, you have the Houthi rebels uh, that have declared war against you out of Yemen. You have Syria firing missiles at you. Then you, then you have the, the head of the snake, Iran, orchestrating all of these, these proxy conflicts. So for, And it's now. <sighs> just can't take it. I'll tell you, Apple has really been having problems ever since the Israeli really Prime Minister. But you know, because you got crazy liberals working at Apple. lost the connection for some reason. Damn it. All right, while I'm trying to figure that out, I'm going to play a video, not a video, but an audio of a rabbi that's talking about how crazy it is with all this gender reassignment. He's a funny guy, so just pay attention, right? Um, but uh, there is a lot of wisdom in what he's saying. Why commercials? There is a truth. 
We believe in truth. We believe that there's a right and a wrong. Judaism actually believes there's a right way to live and a wrong way to live. There's a right way to do things, there's a wrong way to do things. There's a right way to judge and the wrong way to judge. We believe in truth. I'm going to give you an example. I don't want to get carried away, but just to give you an example. I, I'm a second generation American. My father was born in Russia. So I was brainwashed by an immigrant. So I love America. America's a pretty crazy place. And a lot of people say not only America is crazy, it's also stupid. But everybody wants in the world would love to live in this stupid, crazy place if they could. Why? <laughs> First of all, the richest country in the history of mankind. They're very, very, very rich. But there's other reasons. We have a four-letter word which is kind of important in our civilization. It's called free. And it's a big deal. Those of us who were born here don't appreciate what it is. But we're living in America in the year 2023, and we have a lot of people. A lot of people. So some people say that this is a conspiracy and they're trying to control us because I'm a brainwashed second generation American. I'm very, very, I have a very positive outlook at the craziest Americans. There are people in America who have a belief that you have to protect the right of the individual. You have to protect the right. Every individual person needs to be protected. If I decide tomorrow that I'm a goat, if you do not agree and accept with me that I'm a goat, you're offensive, you're a bad person, and you have to be canceled, as they say in the culture. I learned this from you guys, and that's exactly, I'm not in this generation. How, what, how dare you tell me I'm not a goat? Excuse me, I'm whatever I feel, right? This is our culture. Now, that's stupid. <laughs> it's stupid. <laughs> and it's certainly crazy. But what's the root of it? You know what the reason in America, if you're a goat, I have to accept it? Because they want me to be nice. That's the root of it. A lot of wisdom. If you want to be a goat, who am I to stop you? It's rooted in kindness. I believe, I really believe it. I believe that the mission gas in this country about any person, the, the cruelty, the, the line where it goes to being kind to cruel is when they try to convince children that they're messed up because they need them to be messed up so that they, that they should be nice. You have to be so nice. Not that the kid goes up and decides he's a goat, you say he's a goat. So maybe you're a goat. How do you know? Maybe you're a goat. Maybe, maybe think about it. You're only six, but maybe you're a chicken. How do you know? Don't decide you're a boy. We're confusing kids. To me, that's cruel. But they believe that they're actually being really nice. Why are they wrong? If you accept my premise, and I, I, I really believe this, I, I don't believe, and there are nuts, but I believe that by and large, Americans are stupid and crazy. They have this obsession with being righteous. Americans want to be good. And if you decide that you're a goat, I want to be good to you. So that makes you happy. But then you make all kinds of laws about everybody else. You have, to, you have to force everybody else to accept that he's a goat. Because the goodness has to go on. Why is it wrong, guys? Why is it wrong, a be title, to say, if you want to be a goat, I'm going to let you. I'm going to give you a hug and a kiss and call you a goat. I'll give you food in a trough. I'll give you water in a bowl. And you can use this, the base medish as your bathroom. I don't want to interfere with your goatness. Why is it wrong? Why is it wrong? There's only one reason. Only one reason. If you don't believe in the truth, if you don't believe in the Taita, you really don't know where the line is. How kind is good and how kind is bad? People are saying people hurt each other all the time. I don't want to ever hurt any person. If I don't want to ever hurt any person, I have to love every person, however they want to be. Now, what people don't realize is that when you're doing that, all the people who are not crazy are being hurt indirectly by your position. But the only reason it's wrong is because Plato says, this is not true. This is not true. If you don't have Emmys, you can believe anything. You can embrace anything. We have Emmys. You understand? It's true. Emmys. The problem of our civilization is that we've killed God. We've thrown him out of the public school. It's a bad idea. Listen carefully now. When it's dark, it's night. And the night and the darkness means spiritually, when I'm not so smart, when I'm not so sophisticated, Emma's has a sister word. What's Emma's sister word? Vemuna. The truth which is absolute, I believe.
there's a lot of wisdom in what he said. And that boy is extremely intelligent. Um, and he's been around people that are even more intelligent. So don't be a goat. All right. Don't be a goat. And this is the problem with the ultra liberal. Now, he's a little bit nicer in his rhetoric compared to me. But we're saying the same thing. The ultra liberal is causing society to devolve into hell. All right. Have declared war against you out of Yemen. You have Syria firing missiles at you. Then you then you have the the head of the snake Iran orchestrating all of these these proxy conflicts. So I, I ask you this question: If we're going to define what victory looks like, do, doesn't that have to be Gaza can no longer be a launching pad for rockets being fired into your country. Lebanon can no longer be a launching area for rockets being fired into your country. Uh, doesn't that mean the network of terror tunnels, and I've, I've been in some of them, um, as you know, uh, that all those terror tunnels have to be destroyed? Doesn't it also mean on some level that Iran has to be dealt with for total victory? Well, if you connect the dots, you see that there is an axis of terror here against an alliance for peace. The axis of terror is controlled by Iran, run by Iran, financed by Iran. Iran, Hezbollah in Lebanon, uh, Hamas in Gaza, the Houthis in Yemen, and there are other minions. They want to bring the Middle East, the world, back to the Dark Ages, early Middle Ages. That's what they are about. And on the other side stands Israel, the modern Arab states, of course, the United States, all the forces that want to see uh, peace, prosperity uh, for the Middle East and for the world. And that's the battle that is being waged right now. It's being waged right now, most importantly and most decisively, in Hamas, one of the extensions of this axis of terror. And everybody's waiting to see who's going to win. Is Israel going to win or Hamas going to win? But it's not merely Israel's victory. It's our victory over the axis. Because when they see that we defeated them in one place, we'll defeat them in every place. Because that's how power works. They want to see who's winning. We have to win, not only for our sake, for the sake of the Middle East, for the sake of our Arab neighbor, you know what? For the sake of Gazans who have been held by this dark tyranny that has brutalized and brought them nothing but bloodshed and poverty and misery. So we have to win to protect Israel. We have to win to safeguard the Middle East. We have to win for the sake of the civilized world. That's the battle we're fighting, and it's being waged right now. There's no substitute for that victory. It'll affect the other theaters that you mentioned as well. Over 28 communities in the north uh, near the, the border with Lebanon have had to be evacuated. There's always been a concern about a two-front war. Um, my concern is even larger than that, and that is that, you know, if ro rockets are being fired out of Syria or the Houthi rebels are firing rockets into Israel, that becomes an even bigger conflict. But I agree with your general point. You, you always said that that radical Islamists view Israel as the little Satan. America is the big Satan. That's a phrase you've used often. They've used it. They say America is the great Satan, and we're the small Satan. We're just a small Satan standing in their way to get at you, the great Satan, because they, you know what, all these radicals, these terrorists, these monstrous regimes and organizations, they say there's no difference between Israel and the United States. You are them, and they are you, because we represent these same values of freedom, respect for human life, respect for uh, individual liberty. They have nothing of that. They don't care for their people. They don't care for liberty. They don't care for life. They glorify death. They glorify murder. Remember what happened here. I mean, what, what happened here was that Israel was attacked, unprovoked, by a sea of terrorists who stormed into our communities, murdered and raped women, uh, burned children. Uh, I, I met a soldier today, an Arab soldier. In the I am all about destroying Hamas, Hezbollah, destroying Iran, increasing the borders of Israel to biblical times, bringing down the Dome of the Rock, and to, you know, bring back the, 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 the temple. I mean, I'm that, that quote extreme, right? Right? But the reality of the situation is that the Western powers and the Israelis have been kicking this problem down the road for 50 damn years. And so 
in an in a in a, in a, a real way everyone is at fault here for not getting the job done when it was easier to get it done 50 years ago and it just so happened that really really important famous knowledgeable rabbis warned of israel that if you don't do certain things 50 years ago that this is what's going to happen and guess what it happened 50 years later they didn't follow what the rabbis told them to do. And here we are with more capability in terms of unconventional means, more urban centers where, you know, where you have population densities, more destruction, more death. But if you follow what the rabbi said 50 years ago, you wouldn't be here. And the same thing, if you don't get the job done now, it's going to get even worse the next 50 years or the next 20 years. Because the unconventional means are going to proliferate. And the barriers of entry for chemical and biologics are really low. People need to wake the fuck up. That's... What's at stake here? If you're an isolationist and you don't care about the temple and all that bullshit, all right, fine. It's your prerogative. But realize by being an isolationist and not getting the job done is actually going to make the problem worse. Just remember, these people that were warning 50 years ago that if you don't get the job done, it's going to get worse are way more intelligent than you isolationists. And a soldier today, an Arab soldier in the uh, in the Israeli army, who said the first thing I saw was the corpse of a woman beheaded. They behead women. They they fired on uh, uh, youngsters celebrating a music festival. They they put them in a deathbed like in Bobby R in the Holocaust and fired machine guns into them, mowing them down. They took hostages. They took they took a ten month old baby hostage. What kind of monsters hold babies hostages? Holocaust survivors, they took hostages, men, women, children, the elderly. These are monstrous, monstrous terrorists, and they perpetrated the worst horrors uh, against the Jewish people since the Holocaust. And if we let them get away with it, this barbarism will spread. You know what the difference is, Sean? You know, at least the Nazis and Stalin, they wanted to hide their crime. These people glorify their crime. They bring GoPro cameras for their murders to show the entire world. They celebrate it. So who's going to win? Are the good guys going to win or the bad guys are going to win? And of course, we have to make sure that the forces of good, the forces of peace, the forces of progress and prosperity, they win and not the forces that take us back to the dark ages. That's the battle and it will affect every single person, not only in the Middle East, but well beyond. Because if, if Israel is in peril, if the Middle East goes down. The children of Isaac or the children of Esau? You know, he's using the bad guys, the good guys. Telling you, these people need to be destroyed. Good problem. If the Middle East goes down, Europe is next. It's like ISIS. You know, people thought it was a local thing. It wasn't. It was a global thing. And it affected Americans. It beheaded Americans. If we don't win now, then Europe is next and you're next. And we have to win. We have Let to win. There you, is you, no substitute for total Because victory. Esau and Ishmael come from a root that is antithetical to our way of life, all right? That's American way of life. That's Israeli way of life, all right? America is not primarily from Ishmael or Esau. There are, you know, mixed attributes. There's, you know, as people have, uh, you know, a certain percentage of Esau or a certain percentage of Ishmael in terms of an attribute of their personality. But the core of their soul root, all right, is primarily something totally different. And that is from a root that is that is in line with Jacob. All right? Now, people need to wake the fuck up here. Because if we lose this, 
This is ushering in a caliphate. Now, do we want to repeat the loss of the Crusades? See, if the Christians won the Crusades, we wouldn't have this fucking problem. But they lost it. And now we have this problem. For total victory. You, you, you mentioned the atrocities being chronicled and they had GoPro cameras. The IDF has shown people in the media and it's been described in great detail to me and I have an appointment to see this as well. All of these human atrocities that you speak of are on videotape. You have some 40 plus minutes of tape available. Um, I understand uh, and I've, I've watched <coughs> videos of beheadings. These are not images that one will ever be able to erase from their mind, and you wouldn't think that such evil exists in this world, but it does. Um, and these tapes are available for the world to see. You, would it be wise, perhaps, for the IDF to pixel out faces so that families are not having to deal with the trauma of, of seeing this, uh, but let the world see the, the, the magnitude of evil that you are destroying. Yes, they raped women. Yes, they slaughtered babies of women and children. Yes, they beheaded babies. Showing the graphics of it isn't going to change the heart of the person listening. If they don't have the heart to actually listen to words, how are you really going to change their heart by just showing them graphics? Because what it is is then it's just voyeurism. The idea here is to say you got to get to the point that you see this history arc of terrorism, of the caliphate, of all this stuff. Now it's coming home to roost, and it's time to get the job done. It's time to destroy them. I am not wrong. I am not wrong. <clears throat> yes, they beheaded babies. Yes, they burn babies, all of which, much of which has been chronicled. Would it be worthwhile for the world to fully, to, to have the, the moral clarity to understand the barbarism, the monstrous evil wow. that we're talking about here? Because this is, it's on videotape. Yes, you're quite right. Uh, there's a sensitivity of the family. We, we respect that and we try to persuade them to do exactly what you said. And I think we're getting somewhere. We show it to selective leaders in America and elsewhere in the world. And people, you know, people watch these tapes and they shudder. Some break out into tears because the inhumanity, the deliberate, not merely the deliberate murder of people, the deliberate murder, mutilation, the ripping off of body parts. Of now, there's some people out there that say, <clears throat> Paul, you're too biased. You know, you're too pro-Israel. You're too pro-Jewish. And all this stuff. Just open up the Old Testament and read this week's Parsha. And it talks about how Esau is a murderer. And how he's so much different than his brother, his twin brother. And then fast forward, something that was written down thousands of years ago. Fast forward to where we are today. And what did Dr. Paul Cottrell say? What did Dr. Paul Cottrell say? He said, Ishmael and Esau are a bunch of animals. And now we're dealing with individuals. See, you look at an event, and it's not just of the person, but of the people. There are attributes within a person, there are attributes of a society and of a, of a country, of a civilization. If you want to call Ish, you know, Esau a civilization, right? And they represent a root, a soul root. And this is the reason why certain names are brought up in the Torah and in the, you know, the Old Testament. And I, I even remember, you know, I don't know about the New Testament. You probably do the same thing in the New Testament. I don't know. I don't, I don't want to know. I don't care. But you know, the thing is, is that there is a there's a there is a soul root when these names are being brought up and there are certain attributes and they can manifest themselves 
centuries or millennia into the future. This is why what is what was happening in the past is actually happening in the future. They're they're together. It's like a circle, right? It's time to kill Esau. Esau lived by the sword. He should die by the sword. And the ripping off of body parts, the beheading, they're so, you know, it's accompanied with such fiendish glee, the joy of murder, the joy of terror, the joy of torture. It's just uh, absolutely extraordinary. And this is the battle we're fighting. Now, it's a very difficult enemy to fight because it's committing a double war crime. Not only is it deliberately targeting civilians, our civilians, but it's deliberately hiding behind their right. civilians exactly. because they implant themselves in schools and hospitals, uh, in, uh, in uh, UN facilities. Uh, Double in war crime. That's a great phrase, Netanyahu. Double war crime. But on Amnesty International, they won't say that. On Al Jazeera, they won't say that. It's only the Israelis are the bad guys. Yeah. The Israelis. They're the ones that caused all the, you know, the death and carnage. They're sick of baby killers. Yeah. No, Hamas is a baby killer. The Palestinians aren't baby killers. No, 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 no. Esau's not a baby killer. No, no, no. It's not a mistake on Al Jazeera. If you look at their logo, it looks like a devil coming out of a fight. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that is? UN facilities uh, in civilian neighborhoods. That's where they put their rockets. That they, that's where they put their command posts, and they seek immunity there. And of course, we can't give them that immunity. We try to do everything in our power to minimize civilian casualties. But one thing we don't want to do, you know, everybody says, "Man, some okay. civilians uh, as a, as a shield for terrorists." That's wrong. Okay, but we have to make sure that it's not merely condemned. We have to make sure that it's ineffective. And if the if the uh, uh, blame is directed against Israel, against the victim that is returning uh, fire with the, the most judicious use of the military power that's possible in these circumstances, if blame is placed on Israel, then that tactic becomes effective and will be used again and again and again. And we can't allow that. In fact, Hamas is saying they'll do it again and again and again. And that's why we have to win out, root them out completely, but also send a message to the axis of terror you're not going to win. We're not going to let you do this. We defeated you here. We'll defeat you elsewhere. And we should have the entire civilized world line up behind, behind Israel while it's fight, it fights this battle of civilization. It's our common civilization against their common barbarism. Civilization must win. So Israel must destroy Hamas to have peace. If you want peace, destroy Hamas. If you want security, destroy Hamas. If you want to beat the axis of terror, destroy Hamas. This is what Israel must do. This is what Israel is doing. But it's not only doing it for ourselves, for our sake. It's doing it for your sake too, for our common future, for the future, a better future for the for uh, the Israel, for the Palestinians, for the Middle East, for the world. You know, when on one of my trips to Israel, and and I've been there a number of times, and I've interviewed you all in Israel. Uh, but then on one of the trips where there was a flare-up, uh, that was when I went into one of the terror tunnels. So I went, it's almost 100 feet underground. It's, it's sophisticated, you know, almost architecture, and it was all supposed to be humanitarian aid for hospitals and schools and infrastructure. Um, but I also stopped by a city, a border city that you know well, they Road. And while there, you know, prior to my arrival, they have been hit with 10,000 rockets in 10 years. The children cannot play outside. They play in in bunker underground uh, playgrounds in the in that city, um, and that's the same with many border cities. And I, I guess when we get to the the real heart of this, doesn't all of this have to be rooted out? And and for example, while the Iron Dome has been enormously successful and helpful, and intercepted thousands of missiles. Uh, it can no longer be a launching pad. I go back to that part. But also, with 
This is a This is a former Iranian foreign minister. I think it's, it's, I think this is, but this, these types of people, especially the Ayatollah, need to be rooted out. They need to be killed. Because I'm telling you, they're coming from the side of Ishmael and Esau. It's a battle of, of soul roots. But, you know, you got the isolationists that, you know, want to placate to the, Ultra liberal, even though they consider themselves conservative. But also, we, you talk about Hamas must be destroyed. What about Hezbollah? Do you believe a victory over Hamas sends a strong enough message that they stop firing missiles no. from Lebanon you and Israel? Kill them. Israel? You got to kill them. Hezbollah. I think it's a necessary message. It may not be sufficient, but it's definitely necessary because without victory in the South, they're certainly not going to have deterrence in the north against Hezbollah, and uh, we'll have to deal with that. But I think the first step is the first step. And the first step means uh, Hamas did this. Hamas is going to pay for this. Uh, and it's going to pay for this by its total eradication. By the way, you talk about underground tunnel. I mean, they've got a network there of hundreds of kilometers, hundreds of miles of underground tunnels that are used as terror tunnels, as command posts, as command bunkers. Uh, and, and you know what? Their leader is like a little Hitler. He's sitting in the bunker and he's saying, I don't care about what happens to the civilian population on top. One of the Hamas spokesmen said the other day, you know, the, the tunnels and the underground is for us, for the, this messianic, violent, uh, theological cult that has to be destroyed. And he said, above ground, that's not our responsibility. Civilian population, that's Israel's responsibility in the UN. They don't care a hoot about the civilian population. The only one that tries to keep them out of harm's way is Israel. We create safe passages, corridors. We create a safe zone for them. And as we ask them to leave, guess who's trying to prevent them from leaving the zone of fighting? Hamas. It's not Israel that is firing in the safe corridor given to Palestinians. It's Hamas. It's not Israel who's trying to keep these people at gunpoint in the zone of fighting. It's Hamas. So we're, we're dealing here with a brutal enemy that is committing a double war crime of targeting our civilians and hiding behind their civilians, forcibly uh, keeping them in the zone of fighting. And I think all those people who are naive and are, uh, you know, who are either naive or, or misinformed or worse, who are condemning Israel, they should be, I mean, they really should be ashamed of themselves because they're aligning themselves with pure, sheer evil. They should support the forces of civilization that are fighting this barbarism, because otherwise this barbarism will spread. Hey, Sean Hannity here. Hey, click here to subscribe to Fox News. All right, so now what we're going to do is ground operations intensify as IDF fights in the heart of Gaza City. Reserves Lieutenant Colonel Jonathan Conriquez for an update on the situation. Thank you so much, Lieutenant Colonel, for being with us here at I-24 <coughs> News. Uh, I know that there is the diplomatic political window, then there's the reality on the ground. Uh, is there, though, a chance that in the next two to three weeks, which is with the government? We have to go to commercial for PNN. We're in the cold season, so it's really important to get your lozenges and drops. I have structural nano silver lozenges in sweet menthol and also in green apple in a 20 count. All right, so get your lozenges on my store, the studio reykjavikcom The cold season is now until March in the United States. I also have a hundred count drops which are smaller, and it's in uh, honey and lemon and blueberry. So please go to my store and get the drops and the lozenges at the-studio-reykjavik.com. The link is in the description of this video and all my videos. The world's going to hell, so it's really hard to get your REM sleep. So go to my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com, and get your good night formula 
so you can get those that REM cycle sleep so you can filter out those toxins while you're while you're getting that good sleep you're consolidating memory and you are improving your metabolism and your immune system if you have your regular sleep you're going to have a dip, you're not going to be filtering out those toxins properly you're not going to consolidate memory properly you're going to you're going to have lower energy and your immune system is going to go down so what you need is good night formula and by doing this on a regular basis it says tryptophan and melatonin in it take this on a regular basis and you're going to get the proper sleep that you need so so that you get those those three cycles of REM sleep. It's a great way to improve your health as part of that whole anti-aging protocol. Proper sleep, proper exercise, proper supplementation, proper diet, right? And challenge your mind. Don't be a stupid liberal. Back to the news. This is PNN. Government ministers believe is the political window of maintaining global support publicly among our allies. Is there a chance that the most densely populated urban areas within Gaza City can be controlled in the next two to three weeks by the end of the month within Gaza City? Yeah, I'm not entirely sure that two to three weeks is the window. I certainly think that it is bigger, but I'm not going to uh, go into a conflict of assessments. Bottom line is that the idea is fighting. We are implementing uh, the government policy as dictated by the War Cabinet mm -hmm. and uh, advancing according to plan, making significant achievements on the ground. Uh, in fact, uh, causing Hamas battalions, almost all of the Hamas battalions in northern Gaza are at reduced capacity. Some of them have lost fighting capacity altogether. Some of them are at very low levels. Some of them have sustained extremely heavy casualties. The chain of command and rank and file uh, terrorists that have been killed by the IDF. Many of them are buried underground in their bunkers and shelters. And we're making good progress on the ground. Uh, obviously, there are many more uh, Hamas compounds to take care of in northern Gaza, and the IDF will execute whatever policy the state of Israel wants. I think that there is more time, and there definitely is a lot of work to be done. Lieutenant Colonel, as the fighting shifts into now clearly more dense, more urban parts within North Gaza, within Gaza City, the, the war objectives you know, to destroy Hamas as a capable, ruling terror organization to decapitate their ability to wage terror attacks ever again on Israel, but also to locate and bring home the hostages as the fighting shifts to these really urban areas. Are those two goals, do they come into conflict? Uh, there is tension between the goals, but there's also mutual assistance because there are things that we can do, only can achieve while having boots on the ground and soldiers in Gaza. And you see that when, when you're on the ground and you're in friction with the enemy, new intelligence is generated and new opportunities are created in order to engage with the enemy, to collect intelligence and eventually to understand. That is such an important piece of, of why these ceasefires Hamas wants and Israel, Israel wants to just keep on kicking ass. But the bleeding heart liberal goes, save the babies, but I gotta have my abortion. Understand where our hostages are being held, and then once we are on the ground, to think of ways of getting to them. An example would be yesterday when uh, we, when the uh, Israeli uh, Defense Forces spokesperson, Rear Admiral uh, Daniel Hagali, exposed that what we believe still assess that terrorists held some of the hostages underneath the children's hospital, uh, in the Rantisi Children's Hospital in Gaza. And there's a lot of evidence. It's being investigated, and we want to make sure that we are correct about it. But definitely from looking at what we've seen, the ground maneuver allows access, and then troops are able to go to places and collect intelligence that before wasn't possible. And the fighting, therefore, has to be so much more 
even more precise and calculated, knowing that the room for maneuverability is so much more tighter in these areas. Correct. In urban warfare, you can either go fast, uh, but then there's a high rate of casualties, first and foremost for our troops, but also for non-combatants, and that is a factor that we're thinking about. Or you can go slow or slower and be more meticulous and have the ability to lower the amount of casualties. Troop security for the IDF is paramount. We want to minimize the exposure of our armed soldiers. It is an extremely hostile environment that the enemy has prepared in advance with all of the weaponry that has been seen all over the world, anti-tank weapons, IEDs, booby traps, tunnels, and anything else that their Iranian masters can have, have sent them and that they've been able to develop by themselves. So it's a very challenging environment. Therefore, our ground units are working and maximizing Maximizing a very substantial advantage that we have, aerial cover. And we are, I think, this time so far doing very well in communicating and coordinating fires between ground units and aerial units that are supporting the ground operations. Many of the terrorists that have been killed have been killed by friction on the ground with ground troops and then aerial assets taking them out. Incredible coordination. Now, if you're a bleeding heart liberal listening to this channel, do you really want to side on the Palestinians or do you want to side with what's going on with the Israelis? Because I'm pretty sure, I am really sure that Israel is going to fuck up Hamas. Coordination between the different unit fighting units within the IDF. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel, you mentioned the situation within Gaza City hospitals and medical compounds. When you mentioned this new video that we have that the IDF just provided uh, to the world, the evidence is clear evidence that within Gaza City hospitals, they are using rooms, facilities to store weapons, possibly to, at one point, to hold Israeli hostages, uh, store equipment. Here's a clip released from the IDF, a walkthrough of a Gaza City hospital that was used as a Hamas control center. I'm here in Gaza City. We are here next to a house of the terrorists. This is one of the senior terrorists who is the head of the operational naval operations that led the raid into Israel. His house is right next to a, to a school. His house is 200 yards from the hospital, the hospital of Rantisi. Next to his house, there is a tunnel. Call your home security provider and cancel the subscription. This brand new I subscription hate commercials. Now I want to show you an operational tunnel. The tunnel is built with electricity. We first saw the solar panels, then the electricity goes here. And it goes down directly to the tunnel. Now you can see the tunnel. You can see the tunnel. The tunnel is let down more than 20 meters down. The robot found a door, a door that is bulletproof. It's, a, it's explosive proof, so it looks like a hard evidence, a clear evidence that the hospital direction is connected. This is a covered tunnel. It's part of the same floor, and it slides down here. So it's a covered tunnel, so nobody can find it. This is Rantisi Hospital. And this is the place where I showed you the tunnel. I want you to see. This is the back side of the hospital. Hamas used this hospital. Tonight we have entered into this building. I will show you the evidence. Let's enter into the hospital. We're now entering into the area of the hospital where we had the, found the evidence. Uh, this operation was conducted by an uh, Israeli special unit. Israeli Navy seals. This is still an operation that is conducted. And I'm showing you the first evidence to see. This is part of the footage from CNN. We are now, we are now in the area of the basement of the hospital. I want to show you a room where we found all the gear, the operational gear of Hamas. Hamas is using hospitals, like we showed the evidence in Shifa Hospital. In other hospitals, we are now seeing it in live in Rantisi Hospital. 
and operations still conducting right now. Look at what Hamas is holding inside the hospital. I want you to understand, this kind of gear is a gear for a major fight. These are explosives. These are vests vest with explosives. Yeah, it's a body vest for terrorists to explode on forces. Among hospitals, among patients, we have hand grenades, Kalachnikovs, and then we have the RPGs. People are shooting RPGs from hospitals. This is Hamas, firing RPGs to hospitals. The world has to understand who is Israel fighting against. We are now in the basement, and in its basement, we found a motorcycle. They were all used in the massacre of the 7th of October. They even have bullets in this motorcycle. So they came back from the massacre on the 7th of October into an DC hospital with hostages on a motorcycle. We're still researching this. Yachts from here. We find the chair, a woman, clothes, and a rope. A rope next to the legs. And look above this. Look above it. It's a baby bottle. It's a baby bottle in a basement. Above a World Health Organization sign. This is a suspicion for an area where hostages were being held. We're now looking at an infrastructure. You don't need to build something improvisedly in a hospital in the basement. Unless you want to hold someone in the basement, you don't want anyone to see it. Again, we're in the same basement. And here we see diapers, and we see, I don't know, maybe something. We see diapers. I want you to see this room. It's in the basement of the hospital. We can see this area is a closed area from the rest of the hospital. We can see the ventilation air that was done improvisedly to this area. And we can see infrastructure that was built in here, toilets, shower, a small kitchen, will provide the terrorists their needs. Also conduct a hideout, a hideout where terrorists take hostages and hideout. Now we'll show you now the evidence. You're now entering into the room where we suspect the hostages were being held. I want you to look at this room. People are putting curtains with nothing above, just one. No reason to put your curtain unless you want to film hostages and deliver movies. And I will show you more evidence. In this room. If you're a bleeding heart liberal and you're not paying attention to what's going on with these hospitals, you're a fucking asshole. I'm telling you, Esau, his head needs to be chopped off. There is a list. This list in Arabic, in Arabic, this list says we are in operation. The operation against Israel started in the 7th of October. This is a guardian list where every terrorist writes his name and every terrorist has his own sheet guarding the people that were here. Back here in the studio, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Perikas, you know, Admiral uh, Hagari mentioned uh, that the investigation into some of these items still ongoing, that we're looking into some of these things. Is the idea investigating, is there conclusive proof that hostages were actually held there? At this particular hospital, uh, is, is there forensic evidence being collected, is, or is it just a strong indication or perhaps a likelihood, but there's no clear proof that the Israeli hostages were, were there? So let's first acknowledge what we've just seen. Yeah. In a live combat zone, uh, with almost unedited and uncut video, a IDF general inside a Palestinian hospital showing very compelling video footage of what we've been saying all along. It's one thing that- TV news, you call that a walk and talk, where it's exactly. just you and the cameraman, and you just are showing what you're seeing right exactly. for the first time. Instead of telling, we're showing. And it's so important to bring the visual evidence. Now, 
I'm aware of the fact that I'm sure that we will hear on BBC and in the New York Times, they'll say the Israelis claim, or allegedly, and the Israelis showed, and it couldn't be verified independently by BBC or by whatever, because we are held to some kind of impossible level of evidence, perhaps even above forensic or criminal evidence. This, I think, what we've seen is as good as it gets in combat, in war, of presenting substantiating claims that we have made all along. Now, the fact of the matter is that Hamas uses hospital... World Health Organization with a baby bottle. Where's international amnesty about that? And the war crimes that Hamas is conducting. Remember what I said about our generals in the United States? A bunch of participation medals, didn't win a fucking war. Well, guess what? We need more generals that were like the one that was in the in the movie, in the film here, right? Showing how the terrorists are working. Someone that's actually on the ground getting shit done. Hospitals systematically, not a one-off, but systematically relies on hospitals as combat infrastructure. Lantisi is a small example. Shifa is much, much bigger, much more complex, deeper underground. And this video that we've shown isn't about the extraordinary uh, infrastructure that may exist underneath on TC. This is just part of the hospital, which they most likely converted into a holding area for ho for hostages. Now, we don't have forensics yet. We haven't, I don't, I'm not aware of DNA results or tests or anything else that we've been able to do. I'm sure that that is in the work. And once we will have information about it, as long as it doesn't compromise our efforts to get the hostages out, we will uh, share that uh, information. We are as transparent as any military can be in fighting, and we're fighting a battle here of getting the information out and proving what we're claiming. Now, logically, if this is what Hamas did in Lantisi, it stands to reason that under uh, Shifa, they are also there and they're using it. And all of those who are claiming and telling and demanding us of the idea of show us the evidence, prove that uh, Hamas is using hospital, I ask, I tell them, have a look at this and have a look at our track record of saying and proving on the ground and look at the track record of our enemies, of lies and lies and lies. Yeah, the, the expression of the video speaks for itself. It does, and we will provide more videos. Our troops are advancing. We will get cameras underground. We will show tunnels connecting hospitals and Hamas sites. We will show infrastructure underneath hospitals that is used by Hamas. I'm sure that... If this war is giving you high blood pressure and you really want to kill terrorists but you're concerned about your lipid profile because you're stressed out and you're eating too many cheeseburgers you need to take omega-3 omega-3 is going to control and help with your lipid profile what you want is a high hdl and a low ldl all right so please Take Omega-3, go to my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com, and improve your lipid profile. By improving your lipid profile, what's going to happen is, is that you're reducing the chances of cardiovascular disease. Lignans. This will help improve your immune system and your hormonal health for males and females. All right? If you, by improving your immune system on a regular basis, What's going to happen is you're going to be able to target those cancer cells, improve that natural killer cell, and improve that CD8 positive cytotoxic cell. So use this as part of the protocol to boost up your immune system. This is a powder. You put it in you know, water or a smoothie, or I put it in hummus every day with my probiotic. And what will happen is, is that you're going to improve your health. It's a great way to add that to, to the protocol. You need to take magnesium and zinc every day. But when you're in the cold season and you're not feeling well, you need to double the dose. It'll help to, 
to clear the infection quicker. But you want to help boost up your immune system. Have you, have you noticed that there's a theme here? By taking proper supplementation on a regular basis, you're going to improve your immune system and you're going to, you're going to get a lot healthier. So please go to my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com and get your magnesium and zinc. This is PNN. I'm sure that they're busy cleaning up now because they know that we're coming and they want to uh, uh, cover their tracks and make it less obvious what they were doing, but we will find the evidence and we will show it. And then I will be waiting for those journalists who have been screaming out, show us the evidence. I'll be waiting to see what they have to say then. Lieutenant Colonel, I want to ask a question just about the situation in the north and return our eyes to the northern border. Uh, Hezbollah attacks continue. Sadly, soldiers have been killed. Civilians have been killed by the, the Hezbollah attacks. The IDF data shows such a dramatic decrease in rocket attacks coming out of Gaza, more than an 80% drop in the last four weeks from, from IDF data and rockets. We're gonna go into a breaking news announcement. The Dow is up five, over 500 points. As of right now, S&P 500 is up 87 points. If you actually paid attention to what I was saying about the fib sequences and that, those graphs that I've been doing, right? And you've been watching those videos, it did exactly what I said it was gonna do. So not only should you be paying attention to me in, during the crisis that we just went through, but what's going to be happening with the post-crisis and what's going in Israel. And oh, by the way, pay attention to me what I'm saying about what's going to happen in the market. Because that's actually happening. Who can do that? I don't think many people can. Actually, I don't think of anyone could that you listen to. Campbell can't. Campbell's just starting to realize that blood pressure can increase when you have problems with your lungs. All right, Dr. Campbell. Martin, he can't do it either. And guess what? Neither can neuroscientists or IT professionals. Out of Gaza, but Hezbollah continues to attack. Is this <laughs> the new normal in the north for now? I wouldn't call it that. What's happening is that Hezbollah is aspiring to keep things at a certain level of tension. They don't want the northern front, our northern front, to be quiet and stable. They are trying to divert Israeli efforts from focusing only on Gaza. They're trying to split our military capabilities. Our answer to that has been very clear. Lieutenant General Herzi Alevi, the chief of staff, told Hezbollah and Lebanon and the Iranians that up until now, with all of the fighting that we've done, with all of the bombs that the Air Force has dropped on military targets in Gaza, we've used far less than half of the standing capability of the Air Force. And there's much, much more. Planes are ready, bombs are attached to the wings, and they are ready to launch if Hezbollah will escalate the situation further. There's another thing. You mentioned the Israeli casualties, each and every one of them, a world uh, within uh, of, it, of its own, uh, and extremely sad. Uh, two civilians have been killed and uh, six uh, Israeli soldiers. Hezbollah has more than 80, 80 combat casualties, all of them battle-trained militants of Hezbollah that have been trained and have their arms in their hands and they've been trying to fire anti-tank missiles towards Israel. That is a factor as well. And what we're telling Hezbollah is, this is us not yet attacking. This is us only defending. And if you, Hezbollah, will make the choice to escalate the situation, you're going to be bringing Lebanon into chaos and destruction. That will be on you. You are the aggressor here. We're only the defending ourselves. Are wondering, what is that tipping point? What, 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 how many more rockets? How much further into Israel? How many more deaths or injuries? What is that tipping point that you're alluding to? Yeah, so I think that the Minister of Defense gave an excellent answer to that. He was asked, and I'll use his words. Once you'll see uh, hundreds of targets destroyed in Lebanon, you'll know that Hezbollah ha has reached and crossed that tipping point until then. I don't think it would be wise to advertise ahead of time where exactly uh, our tolerance is. I can only say that Hezbollah is 
conducting very dangerous brinkmanship and they are jeopardizing the future and the well-being of Lebanon. And it is, I think, within the interest of everybody, all of the stakeholders in the region, to curb uh, Hezbollah's violence if they don't want a regional war, one that will be catastrophic for Lebanon. It will be bad for Israel, but it will be catastrophic for Lebanon. Call your doorbell camera company and cancel the subscription. This brand new subscription free mini. Well, that's the news for PNN. So please make sure that you go to my store, the studio com. One of the main pillars of the anti aging protocol is taking a strong antioxidant. I have C60 on my store in a two ounce, four ounce, and an eight ounce bottle in coconut oil or in avocado. You take a teaspoon of this a day or a full dropper of this a day if you have the two ounce. And what you're going to do is it'll bring down that reactive oxygen species. So you have charged oxygens just throughout the day and being bombarded from stress, right? And they cause damage to the, at the cellular level and at the tissue level. Well, if you reduce those, you're, you're reducing that damage at the cellular tissue level. And you're allowing your body to heal. And in addition, it'll also boost up the mitochondrial health to boost up the ATP. So the ATP is the energy source that your body primarily needs. It's not the only energy source, but it's a major. So please go to the store, get your C60 in two ounce, four ounce, or eight ounce. My store is the-studio-reykjavik.com and get it in either avocado or in coconut oil. But take this every day as part of your anti-aging protocol. It's a very strong antioxidant. It's way more, way, way stronger, way more potent than vitamin C. It's synergistic with resveratrol. The reason why it's synergistic is resveratrol also is a strong antioxidant, but it helps to get rid of senesc cells. So, and it's, and resveratrol has been known for many, many years to be an anti-aging supplement. I have partnered up with Rainbow Herbals and we have two excellent deodorants. One's in citrus, the other one's in peppermint, uh, tea tree, and lavender. Please go to the store. This deodorant will also help to detox your body. You, t you use this every day. Your, your health is gonna improve. It's made from essential oils, from the Himalayas, has a certain harmonic to it, so it's extremely high quality. Go to the store; it's gonna the bar is gonna last you for a while. T take it every day, and you're not gonna smell like a crazy liberal, and you're actually gonna detox your, detoxify your body. I also have another silver gel. This one happens to be in 35 ppm's. This one is in 24 ppm's. And this has a, a, a special container where you just easy dispensing. So it's great to put it in your bag if you're you know, traveling around, going to work or whatever. So you use this the same way. You put it on your hands, around your mouth, around your nose, around your eyes, around your ears. Helps neutralize pathogens, especially during the cold season. It also can be used as a skincare product. So please go to my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com and get the product that will help to neutralize pathogens. I have many products on my store. Please go to the-studio-reykjavik.com, link is in the description, and get the products that will help to improve your health, help boost up your immune system, and slow down aging. Please subscribe to all my channels. I have three YouTube channels. Please share the links and ask your social networks to subscribe. The stuff that I have to say is really important because guess what? The next crisis, oh, there's gonna be another weapon system that will be released. And you're gonna need someone that actually can walk you through it because there's a lot of stupid people out there that aren't paying attention to the increased risk that is, that is starting to arise. You got a lot of vaccine, you know, you, you know, it, you got a lot of people that 
are, you know, only focused on vaccine injury. You got a lot of people that are focused on virus being a virus denier and all this crap. All right. And like I said, uh, you know, HIV is a big component to this. You know, staying generic. All right. Um, please subscribe to all six of my channels. All the links are in the description. I have Rumble, BitChute, Brighteon, three YouTube channels. Share the links. Get your social network to subscribe. I am censored. And what I have to say is more important than anyone that you fucking listen to. All right? Because I am more accurate on a lot of, of the landscape of what's going on. In addition, in addition, please help support my news coverage by donating on the website, the-studio-reykjavik.com. You can donate through Stripe or PayPal on the homepage. Link is in the description, or you can donate through buy me a coffee, or you can be a paid member, paid channel member for my Patreon channel. That will help to support my news coverage. I don't put anything behind a paywall. I think people that put stuff behind a paywall when it comes to the news is be it's it's self-serving and it's and it's being disingenuous all right and there's a lot of people that do it all right so don't buy into that 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 philosophy now people that create classes to teach people a certain topic that's different right but if you're actually you know covering the news and you're trying to inform people on how to you know, navigate through a major problem like the crisis that we just went through or this crisis or, you know, how to navigate through, through the, you know, the ups and downs of the market. Those are, that's important information that should be free to the public, but people that donate, that allows for that content to be free. All right. So please help support to make sure that the content is free for everybody. All right. And don't support people that are behind a paywall. Thank you for listening and have a nice day. And stay away from blue haired, crazy liberals. And mark my words, Hamas is getting decapitated. <laughs>